for joining me today. Um, I just want to invite you out to Pursuit, where uh, we meet first and third Sundays of the month at 6 p.m. Uh, we're in a current discipleship series over service, and I have Anthony with me today, and we're going to be talking about service in his life and uh, just hearing his testimony and hearing what God has him doing in the uh, kingdom right now. So, Anthony, thank you for joining me. I thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it's you being here. It's good to be here. Man. Yeah. It's good. Um, so for those of you who don't know know you very well, I mean, yeah. I, some people in the church know you, some may not. So briefly tell us, what is it that you're currently doing? What, what is it, what's God got you into right now? Uh, right now, you know, in this part of my ministry, uh, you know, God saved me, you know, uh, some 40 years ago. And right now, currently in ministry, I'm, I'm heading up uh, God's Outreach, uh, Madison County Food Pantry as director and uh, following the vision that God gave me to uh uh, supply food to those in need and, and open up that door and, and uh, that that part of the ministry that, that I'm doing has its own testimony you know if uh, you'd like me to speak on that I can yeah, we'll go get, a little we'll further but we'll go yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's that's what we're doing right now and uh, of course attending here at uh, Richmond House of Prayer underneath the ministry of uh, that is here uh, you know uh, headed up by uh, uh, Pastor Moody who we've loved and known for well, over 40 years, but uh, known him since I've been saved. He's been a great inspiration to me in my personal ministry, you know. And uh, uh, we haven't been attending church here for probably a couple of years now, but uh, I've been a part of Brother Moody's ministry by choice ever since I've been a Christian. Okay. So, wow. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's a great, yeah. great introduction there. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say, if um, if anybody hears the commotion in the background, the kids' ministry, well, the nursery is currently yeah. above us, and uh, they're having a really good time up there. So that that may get edited. They're having out. church. Not, they're, having, they're having church up there. Yeah, yeah. It uh, it may get edited out. It may not. But if you hear, that's what's going on up there. It's something they're having fun. So. Um, all right, so let's start at the beginning for you. How did you come into a relationship with God? You know, I, I was, uh, when I was raised, uh, my mom and dad was very poor, had uh, six children, and uh, my dad was what you might call a sharecropper, this kind of thing. And, and uh, when the work was there on the farm and season of whatever the product was, usually tobacco. But, uh, you know, we, we did fairly good as, as you know, uh, under the poverty line family, but when uh, uh, when things weren't going good, you know, in the winter time, you know, we 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 faced a lot of uh, food insecurities as just a normal part of our life. So, but having said that, all that time up until I was around 13 years old, we had absolutely no church. Uh, no input of the love of God in our life at all. So that was just a complete void when I grew up. And when I was 13, I was uh, asked to come to a revival at a little Pentecostal church over on Estill Avenue, mm -hmm. which is still there, the building is. But anyway, I went there just to, just to be with the kids, mm -hmm. you know, and didn't know anything about church. And uh, they, they, they got to sing, and those old saints was having church, and they got to sing and reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. And I'll never forget it. The Lord appeared to me, and I, I, I realized I was lost and undone and went to the altar and prayed. It, because of the lack of support, I suppose, that's not an excuse, but, you know, right after that, probably a few months after that, I went right back out into the world. Okay. And, and I was in the world till I was 30 years old. And uh, during that time, I'd become, before I was half grown, actually, I'd already become an alcoholic and on drugs and this kind of thing. So I ran real hard from God for 17 years. And he, he, continued, he constantly done his part, but, you know, I, I ran to the point where I was at the, at the Past, past the point of death for me personally, and, and my family knew that and stuff. But anyway, when uh, uh, I come back to the Lord, and I can't go into all that story, uh, you know, but uh, not enough time. But anyway, when I come back to the Lord, I did, it wasn't by design, never thought about it. But some the pastor and, and the, uh, the church that I I'd actually went to, if my wife was going there, never occurred to me until after I was saved. But I ended up at 17 years later, the same building at the same altar, wow. repenting of my sins and receiving Jesus Christ, and consequently, you know, being delivered from uh, uh, from the, the, where sin can actually take people yeah. if, if they hold out long enough and pursue it on that level that, that I did. And uh, but it, it was a, it was a, a marvelous 
a miraculous thing that I was saved and that burden lifted off of me. I knew nothing because of my background. I knew nothing about Christianity and, and I knew nothing about church. And I probably put a little plug in here real quick. A lot of times the church itself hinders people over the years since I've been saved. Uh, you know, the church is doing so much better at it as far as operation, you know, and, and bringing people into the kingdom of preaching the word and then being convicted by the Holy Ghost. But when, when I was saved, the, the the church, the churchy stuff, you know, I was so far removed from it. You know, I didn't know anything about Scripture. Now looking back, I know what was going on. You know, all I knew that I was blind and now I could see. I was lost and now I could found this marvelous grace that elevated me out of that pit that I'd been in so long. But uh, uh, for about six months, I was really almost driven out of church itself because of the uh, churchy stuff. Because as a sinner, just saved in, by grace into the, the organized church, I looked around and I thought, I'm never going to be a Christian. Because I thought that's what a Christian was. I thought I had to attain to something. Yeah. So all the testimonies and all the language and, and all this thing. It was like, I, had, I had no idea. <laughs> it was completely void. But anyway, I went to an altar one night instead of quitting. I went there and told the Lord I was going to quit. I got some of my greatest answers when I was quitting God. You know, he would intercede and go that, you know, that long suffering whom he is yeah. into my person. But, you know, I told him I was going to quit. And, and finally, I think at the altar that night, he just kind of got tired of listening to me cry. That kind of negative uh, prayer and uh, he just spoke to me and said what can you do and when God asks you something you know you're the same one that delivered you you're like I had to come up with an answer I said only thing I can do is come to church I'll be committed to that I'm not going to do anything else I can't do this but I'll come to church I can't I can't attain to this standard but I can come me, but. I, I made a commitment and 40 years later you know I, I don't miss church you know, and, and little did I know how much is all we found out when we were, we were saved. You know, that real, real life going to church is really just the actual doing it is really one of our greatest challenges, yeah. you know, uh, is going to church. So that commitment I made carried me a long way just by saying, hey, I got to go. I don't feel like it. I don't like what's going on. I don't like this or that, but I got to go. Yeah. And that's where it gets worked out. It, it almost when you were saying that, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so if, if this doesn't come out the right way, then, then correct it. But it almost sounds like it was at that moment that you divorced, like, religiousness. Absolutely. And you married. Yeah. You, ma you married yeah. the presence of God in that moment. Yeah. Where, where it was just like, yeah. okay, I can't do that. I don't know what that is. And God's just like. I think the, I think the sheer don't. simplicity of it yeah. is I, I never could get married to religion, although I had chances even as a sinner. You know, I, you know I'd listen to people from uh uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and to Catholicism to the different ministries and even the the, the real church you know the the body of believers and uh, I never could join it but I always seen the differences in the real move of God even as a sinner you know so I never had really a chance and I think that's uh, 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 that's carried me a, a long long time because I never really had an opportunity to marry religion you know the the power of people being saved when they're younger is they have that, that, that intimacy that they grew with Christ to a point that I will never know. The good thing about not knowing Christ, you're just at, at, at the edge of hell getting ready to get kicked in, you know, is that you don't know a lot of this, this Christianese and stuff. So all you know is the power of God and the deliverance. You know, there's no opportunity to play games for, per se, you know, and that's just, uh, uh, I've known that for 40 years, you know, so there's there's no really no option and it, it allows people, uh, whether they've been saved since they was born or saved just like I was in later life, you know, but it gives them opportunity to understand and grow in the simplicity of Christ and Him crucified and the absoluteness of the kingdom of God. Because we all know as we grow older and we're teaching and preaching, God's setting us forth, you know, there ain't, there ain't, I say it crudely like this, excuse my English, you know, but there ain't no cheating in the kingdom. There ain't no lying. There ain't no division. Not in the kingdom. And that's where we're supposed to be in the first seeking of the kingdom of God. So that's what it's about for all of us. Praise Good. God. Thank you for sharing that. It's all right. This is, this is great because like the people, I, the people need to hear, because we're going to get to the ministry that you're part of. Yeah. People, people need to hear what was it like to go from, you know, the beginning to where you're at now? Because sometimes I think, you know, when they come into the kingdom, it's like, they're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get started. I, I don't feel like I'm yeah. equipped to do anything. I don't feel like I can. And yeah. when they hear the testimonies of people who are being like, listen, 
I started this thing off the same way, and all I did was just say, that, okay, God, I'm, I'm with you. I'm going exactly to follow right. you. And, yeah. and it, it encourages us. That, you know, in the not knowing, mm -hmm. you know, you can't embrace it because you, you have to grow in grace and knowledge, but the not knowing really would take is, is what taking people further than they really realize. Because if they don't know, you know, I, I'll give a small testimony. When I was first saved, I didn't know anything about church. Yeah. And at that particular time, there were certain positions in church, mm -hmm. you know, for people that's, not really uh, recognized too much today in our, uh, you know, in our church and society in general. But back then, you know, for one thing, and I didn't know this, and what a blessing, you know, because I didn't know, you know, only in that particular church and, and really in that organization, really, if, if you clean the church, you're female. I didn't know that. You know, so I'm sitting in church just, and you know, you have to understand when I went to the altar, I literally felt demons hanging off of me. So it was so, the whole thing was so terrible, you know, just, it was the dying thing and, and getting, just growing in His grace. It was a long time and it was hard, hard, hard stuff and grace, God's grace was, was sufficient. But when I sat in church, you know, one of my first little growing steps, I sat in church probably six months into it, you know, and I'm sitting in church determined to stay, you know, and everything dictated taking that I shouldn't, you know, but that kind of thing. But when I was there and a uh, pastor got up one night and said, uh, sister so-and-such is not able to clean the church anymore and uh, said, I want somebody to step up tonight and, uh, you know, and, and take that position, clean church. And uh, everybody sat around there, you know, I was looking around. Nobody's, nobody's answering the call, you know. And I thought, wow, wonder why not? You know, because the same grace that has saved me and delivered me all this, this was opportunity and privilege, you know, to me. I didn't care about the, what was asked. But, you know, so finally, you know, he was kind of asked again. Nobody answered. And so I raised my hand. He looked kind of puzzled from the pulpit. And he said, uh, yes, Anthony. He said, what, what, what is it? I said, I'm cleaning the church. And he said, no, brother said, you understand. He said, this is cleaning the church. And he was kind of looking around like, somebody going to help me here? And nobody helped him. So I said, I clean the church. He finally had to give in. He said, okay. All right. Probably, you know, for ever how many months that was in my infancy, you know, it was probably my fundamental, some of my most growing time, not necessarily in church, but just being alone with God. I would clean those wooden pews and the altar and cry, you know, and go downstairs and clean the Sunday school rooms and wash dishes. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was just that one-on-one -on -one with God. So, yeah, it's a, it's, it, it's a great thing, just not sometimes not knowing. And, but that's the reason Christians have got to keep encouraging people to get in just like we do here. Praise God. And I think that that's so, um, that's almost counterintuitive for, for new Christians sometimes whenever they get, um, think of how to say this politely, they get indoctrinated by the wrong people. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's that I have to get to a certain place before I start yeah. growing. And God's like, oh, I actually know it was in Damascus Whenever Paul didn't know what he wanted to do, that's, that he grew. That's exactly he just, right. He just went and did it. Yeah, whatever, three like, years or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it was it's the same a, thing with you where it was that's like, right. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to start yeah. serving. And yeah. in the process of serving, you yeah. found his presence was there and was just pouring Absolutely. into you. Man, that Absolutely. Is, I heard a little sermon, and keep me in check, I'll over talk sometimes. So I heard a little sermon back there in that little building. I don't know who the minister was come around, but uh, was preaching a sermon one night. And, and it's one of those little revelation things that, you know, you get to get, get a hold of in your new birth, you know. And uh, he, he preached a message, you know, on that you can't do it anyway, you know, basically. And, and Christians got to come to terms with that. The more you got to yourself trying to do it, you know, it's an, it's an obedient thing. And, you know, he's preaching probably from the, from the scripture of uh, Matthew 6, 33 and the first seeking the kingdom of God. But uh, whether this is scientifically true or not, that's what he said. And I believed him. And that's all it mattered to me. Uh, but anyway, he said that, you know, Christianity, you know, it's like a bumblebee. He said, we have bumblebee faith. And he said, scientifically, because of the shape of a bumblebee and the proportionally of the body and the wings, mm -hmm. you know, a bumblebee can't, scientifically can't fly, but right. the bumblebee don't know it. <laughs> so it flies anyway. So, yeah, it's little things like that. You know, we got we got people, you know, like I said, in their people's infancy when they can't, that's what the church needs to really really help them grow in, you know, because you, you can't do it anyway. Yeah. What do you mean? You, you know, just... It's like, what if what if we actually approach things from the standpoint of grace, like right off the bat? That's right. We just, we yeah. just started yeah. off with, with really pouring into understanding what yeah. grace is instead of, you know, you got to look a certain way, you got to sound a certain way, exactly you got to right. you know, do the right things. Yeah. It's just like, no, let's, let's take it from the... 
you can't do it anyway. So how do you? How do we get you connected with the one who can? That's exactly you, right. How do we get you connected? Yeah. You know, abide yeah. in the vine, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes that same thing. Our, our uh, I told a uh, friend of mine. Uh, a 9-11 responder. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. But anyway, he contracted that lung disease and stuff. Just a great uh, 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 Catholic Christian friend of mine, you know, and uh, we were talking about that. And he's talking about Catholicism, which he was born again. And, and he really, because he was born again, a lot of that traditional stuff he didn't accept, obviously. But, you know, we had some real good conversations and stuff. But we were talking about that one day. And I said, listen, Glenn, I said, it gets as simple as this. You know, in ministry, you know, you can you can look at me and you can look at other people and say, you know, man, they're doing such a good job or, or not doing such a good job. I said, the only merit is in Christianity as far as we're concerned. And I used the, 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 the analogy, I guess, you know, I said, listen, we're just like bird dogs. He said, what do you mean? I said, we're just point men. I said, the best pointer wins. <laughs> you know, like you know it's just, it, we're just pointing. And, and that's what we get to do to these young Christians because grace is we're saved by grace, Paul said in Ephesians, through faith. You know, we realize that. We realize that's our, the fundamental truth of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But somewhere in the mix, in the organized church perhaps, you know, somewhere in the mix, I think I talked to too many, too many Christians that really still don't understand grace is no more than unmerited favor, which that's all it is. But they really have never really experienced the power of grace. You know, and that's what we, you know, people, that's what they're growing. You know, John said, uh, and I'm maybe jumping ahead a little bit, what, you know, uh, uh, no, the scripture stuff, but John said, in, in, you know, that that you received in the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, what you receive grace, mm -hmm. you receive the power of God revealed that, that indicated that we were sinners lost and undone. And we reached out for help simply as that. But the power of grace, I think it's kind of looked over sometimes. You're like, you know, unmarried your favor. Okay, now I got to go get strength and do my own thing. You're like, no, yeah. that's the power of the gospel. God so loved the world, you know, and and uh, 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 Paul talked about it in Romans chapter one. But you know, it's it's not anything that that we're going to be able to do on our own. And, and uh, I always say there's there's two parts of the church. That, that's manifested on the earth, the hinder of lawlessness, we might say. There's two parts of that. There's the church that's going forward, not speaking of who's saved and who, who is not, but there's the church going forward that's really on the outside working as part of the church, and then there's church in the abiding in John 15 that's actually connected to the vine, you know, and that's where all we, we have to get people there. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and Paul said he, he talked about the grace of God that worked effectively in him. Like yeah. he he did everything. I mean, he he did a lot. I mean, to say that is that yeah. be well, this is the, the grace understatement. We ain't gonna get there, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But he even said, oh, but all this I did, it was just the grace just God grace. that worked effectively. Just in grace. Me. Just and grace. that analogy you were making there between the, that outside and that abiding church, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with someone recently about how we have servants that are hanging out on the outside, but then we have sons and daughters that are at the table. That's right. You know, and, and we yeah. were kind of going through that conversation about how many times Christians would just see themselves as servants. If you asked them, like, you know, if you played that scene out and said, now, are you on the inside or the outside of the house? They, many Christians would say, I feel a lot more comfortable on the outside well, you know, sure. serving. And in reality, serving should be coming from a place of Absolutely. we're abiding, we're in sonship. We know who we are that's in right. Christ and that's right. we're loved and we're in the, we're in the beloved. Yeah. So that's where I serve from. I don't, I don't serve to try to get there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, and, you know. and Jesus talked about that. And Peter was the, 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 the servant on the outside there for a while, actually all the time he walked until he denied him, you know, and, and yeah. Lord appeared to him on the shore of Galilee, you know, and went through that thing in the last part of John. But up until that point, Peter was actually that servant on the outside and, and he kept, you know, sticking his foot in his mouth and stuff, you know, right down to the very end, you know, and, and even at the, what we refer to as the last supper, you know, the, the meal before. The, the passion was completed in, in Christ. But, you know, even down to that, he was on the outside. You're not washing my feet, Lord. Mm -hmm. 
Still you know, he didn't know the servant part as far as in the abiding, not just I'm my own person and I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to stand for Christ. Yeah. You know, uh, anyone that does that, and we've all done it probably to some extent or another, you will fa find those times of failure in your life. Uh, and, and I'll just say this one real quick. In, in Corinthians, Paul touched on, on the fact and it gets kind of confusing some of the language there, but look into it. It's very clear, of course, like all scripture. But, you know, he said, I know a man, you know, but so many years ago, whether in the body, out of the body, you know, he's caught up to the third heaven, tells all the things because what he's seen and heard, he wasn't able to bring it back to the earth. And for that reason, he was given a, a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him in his flesh, in his mind, whatever that flesh consisted of. But anyway, the whole point is, you know, he's talking about all the things Paul did and went through, and he lists the list several times, you know. You know, and we're, we're thinking, I, I can't do that. And he couldn't either. And that was the whole point. Yeah. And that was the point he was making there in that particular scripture because he took it down that, that, that trail of grace, you know. And he said, basically, and me just ad libbing, he said, you know, this thing got so bad that I wasn't going to take anymore, couldn't take anymore. It was all over. He said, I asked God. King James says besought him, but he, I asked God three times. This guy had been through all this. He said, I asked God three times for relief. And I used to think when I was a younger Christian, God was telling him to suck it up. That's not it. it He's speaking of the power of grace and, and demonstrating that. You know, he said at the end of it, Jesus told him, said, Paul, you know my grace is sufficient. It doesn't matter what's going on. You know, this grace is that powerful. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's time. Even Paul was still growing in grace and knowledge. Peter spoke to in the last part of uh, his second letter. You know, he was still growing in that grace and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Even though he'd been to heaven, was he getting celebrated because he'd been to heaven and heard all this? Nope. <laughs> he was suffering and going through a hard time until the, until the very end when Jesus appeared to him and, and spoke grace. Yeah, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm really glad that you're, you're bringing this out from the grace perspective because uh, you, what, you're, what you're saying is that everything that you do, all the service that you do, which we're going to get into talking about that, it, it all stems from the grace of God. It's not right. your own strength. It's not your own ability. It's the That's power right. of grace working effectively it. in you. Yeah, yeah, it is. Jesus said something, a couple of different scriptures, you know, he's a couple of different places, but only one of them that he said it like this, comparing, uh, comparing the different house buildings that we're building, you and I building, Christianity building, individually and in particular. But we're building, and Jesus spoke of that, about the two different houses. One dug down, laid the foundation, found the rock, built a house on found the rock, and the other one built on the sand, consequences of both of, of those things. But uh, prior to that, a lot of people overlook this. You know, in a couple of other places, it only mentions that those that hear my word and do my word. You know, they're likened to that man building his house on a rock. The first part in one of the Gospels, I think it's in John, you know, he, he had a, a first before the other two about the hearing and doing. He said, those that come to me and hear my word and do my word. You know, so that's the empowerment, you know, of, of coming to him. And, and that's if anything ever come out of good out of my life, that's where it comes from in ministry. Yeah. Simply. So, so, you know, just talking to you right now, it's, you, you have a, you have a strong biblical knowledge. You've been at this for a little bit. Um, so from your perspective, like, uh, over the years, just how God's molded you, shaped you, how, how would you describe what it, what servanthood, just simplistically, how, how would you describe servanthood in the kingdom from the scripture, from your experience with God, from what he's revealed to you? What does, what's true servanthood look like in the kingdom? You know, servanthood, it, it, it has to take, and we, we preach and teach a lot about it in, in specifics, but, you know, servanthood is, is nothing. You know, it, it goes back again. I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll quote uh, John again in First John. You know, it goes back to that that you received in the beginning. That, that first initial deliverance and His grace appeared to us, you know, it, that working of the power of God within us, you know, the first thing that I wanted to do, you know, when I was delivered, saved by grace through faith and all the miraculous things going on in my life, as hard as they were, you know, the first thing I wanted to do was the, all the things were completely opposite. But one of the big things that I was known for, you know, just as my personality, I suppose, or whatever, you know, first thing I wanted to do, which was 100 eternity opposite from who I was, first thing I wanted to do is give everything away. 
my wife had been a Christian for nine years. She's one of the main physical reasons through prayer and fasting that, that actually after nine years that I was born again. But my wife, even after nine years of, of being a Christian and fighting that good a fight of faith, and, and in particular even for me, you know, uh, the born again experience that took a hold of me, she was so concerned because if they had, if they had lines to give stuff away, I was giving it away. And I didn't have much. I mean, you we were. Give it away. I had given it all away, you know. And that right there is initial thing. That's that's a, the initial ingredient of servanthood, you know. I wanted to go, you know. I, I I was going to the same people where I worked at the plant and had half the plant underneath kind of a a, a drug control because I was selling drugs and and I was I was involved with the upper corporate level, you know, to certain bars and stuff and and the truck drivers that, that I was over, you know, and all these drugs that kept them going. We all drank and partied and stuff, and, and that, that initial servanthood that took a place in my heart, mm -hmm. I was going telling those people about Jesus. And of course, where I come from, you know, they were all laughing. It was a big joke for a long, long time, you know, and, until they finally realized, you know, and people would come up and say, you're really serious, aren't you? Something's different. Afraid so. <laughs> you know, afraid so. So, but that, you know, that, that is real servanthood. You know, you're wanting to do for others, you know. And, and, and that's still what, what motivates me today, you know. I don't, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it really needs to be more and more a dying process to self, you know, and, and it really does. And only, only Christ gives us that. And, and again, it's what we received in the beginning, yeah. you know. Uh, we weren't anything. We had nothing, and, and we were introduced by the Spirit of God to Him that, that owns it all and who is all in all. Yeah. You know, so, you know, our joy and, and, and your joy in doing what you do and all the joy of people that serve God is in being a servant. You know, and, and Jesus spoke about it. You know, if you want to, if you really want to be a good leader, if you want to be a great leader in, in the kingdom of God, serve. Yeah. You know, that that's that's what's so we're abiding, and then out of that place of abiding, we're putting others before us, and we're just Absolutely. looking. How can I? How can I? Reveal Absolutely. the love of God, the power of God, the Absolutely. kingdom to these people. Absolutely, the whole power of of, uh, of servanthood. You know, Jesus said, you know. Uh, the two laws, of course, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body, and love uh, your neighbor as you love yourself. Yeah. Let me tell you something, Joe. We ain't, none of us got there yet, okay? No. Not in demonstration, but we're headed that way, and we're dying out daily to to be servants. Because here's here's the work, and, and speaking of that on the corporate level of, of the world itself, the church is really failing. You know, you and I are failing. How can I say that? Because the church is getting world, the darkness is overtaking the light, and the light chases darkness. So, anyway, that's another conversation, of course. But that same love, when Jesus said, "Love your neighbor as you love yourself," guess what? If I truly love you as I love myself, I'm a servant to you, and you're not going to ever need anything because I'm going to make sure I don't need anything. And if I, if I put you first, and if we put our neighbors first and we're serving each other, there's no schism, there's no division, there's no envy, there's no strife. That love of God, that, it, that that's, so that's, that if, if there is a failure of the church mm -hmm. in the last days, it's the same failure as always been. You know, it's, it's, we're not being the light because the light expels darkness. We know that. Right. We preach it. We live it. You know, so that, that it's the love of God in us that's, yeah. that's got to do that servanthood. But, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Praise so how, in your walk with God, you, know, you, you talked about those early years you were, you just volunteered to, to clean. Yeah. And it didn't fit the, uh, didn't fit the paradigm for the church. You know, yeah. Anthony, you know, it's, it's not, it's, anybody going to help yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody yeah. going to help me here? Yeah. yeah. But, but in those early years, you, you began to be poured into by God and be molded and shaped by him. When did you start feeling like God was saying, all right, Anthony, it's time for you to start pouring into others. It's time for you to start making disciples. Like, you, what, what was that like for you? You know, I can only tell you the real experiences that God done in my life, you know, and I'm satisfied that, that he doesn't in every believer's life, you know, uh, maybe it's goes unnoticed sometime and that may be detrimental to our Christian walk, you know, in the forgetful part. But, you know, for me, you know, I was probably, oh, I was probably saved about a year or so. I'm just going in that time period because I know where I was at and the things that was going on. But my actual call was a, uh, it was a personal call uh, from Christ himself. And I'm, I'm, 
I, I just, you know, I'll just say this real quick. You know, I, I'm not a person that goes around. You'll probably never hear me go around and saying, you know, I had a dream. I had a vision. God spoke to me and this and that. And, and if I say it, it's just going to be something I experienced like, like it should be with you and, and everyone. But anyway, but con when I really knew what, what my calling was, uh, the particular calling, you know, that, that would encompass later on, I'd find out would encompass a lot of different offices, you know, within the body of of Christ, you know, everything. I think I work pretty much everything just in, in helping or taking part or being being in a position, everything but a pastor. And uh, I'm still holding out. Never, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Pastor's rough. But anyway, uh, you know, I, I had a dream as a young Christian. You know, I had a dream one night. And when, when, when I was a child, we lived on Estill Avenue. And I was probably, I'm just guessing from that time period, somewhere around four to five years old. And I always remember all my life living on that street and I remember it evidently it was the weekend or something because it was summertime and it was always dimly lit and there was houses right side by side each other and there was a lot of drunk people and a lot of people you know that was uh, at that time I guess they would have been classified as the drags of society and there was like bars up here and a bar down there up on Main Street and, 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 and that kind of stuff anyway but that had always been in my mind I never really forgot that time and in and, and this dream I found out why you know when, when God God called me in particular in this dream I was that child again except I was an adult but I was still experiencing it as a child I don't know make any sense but I was I was adult and a child both sons kind of and uh, I was on that night and it was like on a, one of those hot summer, summer nights and the men and the women were drinking some people was coming out and talking and and all this commotion was going on and 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 uh, I was walking down the street and I was just looking around I was thinking you know this is just like it was when I was a child and as I approached up there was a woman sitting there and she was talking to a girl in front of her it was actually I thought it was her daughter, and, and the daughter had a, a baby wrapped in a blanket. And and as as uh, uh, I heard them talking, I was I was kind of I know they were looking at me. I was walking by, and I was kind of you know ignoring them. And I kept hearing this woman tell her daughter, said he can, he can. I thought, I don't know what they're talking about. You know, I was just kind of looking around still because I'm in a dream. I'm thinking, yeah. you know, I know what's going on. This is this is this little street, you know, kind of thing. And uh, finally, she looked at me and she said, he can. And the little girl turned around. She had the blanket, this baby wrapped in a blanket. And when, when she turned around and, and looked at me, I seen her face, and she was just totally in distress and stuff. And God spoke to me and said, you can. And so she turned the baby around and uncovered him. And his face was real twisted. And I don't, I don't want to get too graphic, but his face was real twisted, this baby. And, and this little girl gave me the baby, and I, it was horrible. And she gave me the baby, and I took it in my dream, and I forced myself to take it up like this, and I wanted to hold it out. And I, I forced myself to put it like this, and the love of God for that child started flowing through. You know, and so that was just my, my first initial thrust into, you know what, the love of God overtakes anything. And, you know, if we can get that message out to him and, and live this gospel, you know, and I knew that baby, I never released it in the dream I woke up, but I knew that baby was healed. So, you know, that was that was my initial introduction to, saying, you know, go, go love the yeah, I, did, I didn't have any, when I woke up, yeah. I really didn't have, you know, right after that, I got involved in all kinds of outreach ministries and, and I always thought it was so ridiculous for God to call someone like me and any kind of, we went immediately in that church after that, we went into a building program and, and just a few of us with hardly no money bought five and a half acres and we built Lexington Road Church of God, you know, and from there, you know, we went into, uh, I went into a, uh, uh, God called me into a bus ministry, you know, working where Tommy and those guys were out, you know, mm -hmm. in Turpin Drive and stuff when people were scared to go over there and they should have been, they should have been where it was going on. But anyway, we went over and, and, and uh, I, I led a bus ministry for seven years there out in Madison Village, Smith Village and these different places. And uh, got a lot of kids in the church and stuff. So, and that's kind of from that, knowing those people, the need and stuff, it's kind of for me personally, my calling went into the food ministry. So, Okay. Wow. Well, there's, uh, there's some other questions I think we'll, we'll, uh, 
we'll save those for the next one. This would be a good stopping point because we, you've kind of shown like what the buildup has been. Yeah. I'll talk your ear off. Oh no, I, I love it. People, people are people are gonna love this. This is been this is great. Yeah. And you know this this uh, sermon series that we're we're doing so this month is over service. Right. And what does it look like to to serve? What does it look like to to step into what God, what you feel like God's calling you toward? Yeah. Um, some people they say, well, I don't feel like God's calling me to anything. Um, just before we wrap up here, you know, and we'll, we'll pick up on the next part, but yeah. what would you say to those people who say, well, I don't, I don't feel called to something. I don't, well, I don't feel like I've got a calling. What, what, yeah. what would you say? Well, you know, we're all called is the first thing I would tell them, you know, and, and the directional purpose of God's leading by the host, Holy Spirit is forward and, and they are called, even if it's just to come to church like my testimony is, mm -hmm. but they are called and, 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 and that their calling to serve others is, is they're going to be their growing. They, they can't necessarily going to see, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be what they think, yeah. you know, but God does have a calling for all of us in particular, you know, no no one can reach your family. No one can reach those people that's going to be introduced to you day, to, day by day to lift the Lord Jesus up. I think a lot of the problem, you know, is is maybe still comes from the church a little bit. You know, a lot of the problems I dealt with in bus ministry, you know, my, my, my kids and my family, I took them into ministry with me. My daughters can tell you today they spent a lot of their Saturdays out in places they wish they were somewhere else, you know, but uh, and, and, and now that, you know, that, that kind of took hold of them like priming a well, but, you know, you know, they, they, they've got to go forward, you know, and, and just because, you know, it don't look good. Yeah. And I think that's a thing because in bus ministry, like I said, I had so many people during that seven years, you know, oh, Brother Anthony, oh, Brother Anthony, it's just so great. I see you bringing these kids in, you know, and, and this is just so great. I want to go out on the bus ministry. It's good. Yeah, that's great. Some would last a week, some would last a month or two, you know, but it costs you something, you know. And, and, and that's what they, they don't they don't need to be that doesn't need to be hid from them. You know, it, it does cost something. But, you know, and that don't it might sound like a bummer, but really it's encouragement. Mm -hmm. You know, we encourage people, let them know, you know, God needs you, you know, and, and, and he's got a, he's got a particular calling on your life. You know, and, and, and that, that anointing that that Joe Johnson has, you know, I, I, it's the same anointing, the same spirit, but it ain't mine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's personal between you and God, and, and He'll use you in ways that, uh, and, and they can be used. I don't care who they are. Yeah. You know, that's right. I, just, I mean, the greatest people I've known, I've, I've, I've spent time with people in my family years ago, and uh, an uncle in particular for, for months dying of cancer, you know, and I heard it out of him all the time. He was a deacon in the Baptist church for nearly 40 years, very active, very powerful man of God, witnessed me when I was a kid and a sinner, he made an impression on me, you know, as, as far as the witness and stuff goes. And, and uh, But I've heard him time and time again. I'd have to correct him, you know, because he's like, I, I don't have anything to offer now. And I'm like, really? You're sitting here on this bed and going through you, what God's taken you through and your intercessory prayer and you're praying with me and sharing the Word of God with me. And he said, it's good, ain't it? And I said, it is good. So now they got a place. They got, they got something to do. That's good. They can do something for me. <laughs> Praise there's, God. Always, there's always work to be done. Amen. All Amen. right. Well, this has been a great, uh, a great introduction to your life, and we'll pick up Thank you, brother, uh, the specific area that God's got, yeah. you, uh, got you working in right now. So, Praise God. And like I said, we're doing our sermon series over service this month. Uh, I want to encourage you to come out and join us. Come be a part of Pursuit. If you're listening and you don't, you don't uh, come to Pursuit and you're in this age group, then come out and join us. We, uh, we just had our night of worship last night out at the coffee shop, so we're recording this uh, ahead of time before the sermon series starts. So last night... November we uh, we had our pursuit night of worship and we had 50 Great. 60 uh, I don't know the exact number but I think it was somewhere around 50 or 60 young adults come out uh, and Pastor and Sister Gail came out and, and joined us as well and we just worshipped in the coffee shop and it was awesome it was a really great time um, so with that being said go do what Jesus said and we'll see you next time.